Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us on the We Thrive podcast, where we share stories from entrepreneurs around the world about how they're creating an impactful legacy. I'm your host, Casey Clark, founder and chief growth officer of C. Clark Consulting, and today I will be interviewing Ed Crow, who is a talent transformation expert with Ed Crow LLC. So I'm so excited to interview you today, Ed. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, let's start with the fun stuff first. Um, I am living every guy's dream. I am surrounded by women in my life. (laughs) I've I've got a wonderful wife. I've got three daughters. We had a fish for a while. That thing was probably a (laughs) <laughs> as well. um, the, the team that uh, helps me uh, work with my clients, all female, so I, I don't know, but uh, uh, so it's, it's a pretty good life, but I've um, been doing this consulting thing for the last 20 years now, and um, my, uh, my marketing person had me do a little research on my clients last year, and we realized I've worked with over 250 companies, and wow. I was just like, Whoa. <laughs> you know, you just don't think about how, how those numbers pile up over the years. And it was a, an aha moment for sure. So um, love helping businesses uh, thrive and, and get over their hurdles and break through ceilings and that kind of thing. And it's what, uh, what keeps me going. And, you know, people say, gosh, Ed, you know, you've been doing this a long time. Yeah, because I have fun at it. <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome so tell us a little more about you personally where are you located so i'm in central pennsylvania uh heart of the amish country in, in lancaster county and uh born and raised here uh we uh, we love to travel through the south uh where we intend to retire there and um I, I've, I've been wanting to get to the south my entire adult life and things keep me hooked here uh in the mid-atlantic which is fine um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the day, uh, yeah, maybe not in the too distant future, uh, we, we want to get down, uh, and be in Florida permanently. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> I currently coach my, I have, uh, two grown daughters. They're out of the house in their twenties and I still have a 13 year old at home and, uh, coach her softball team and love doing that. Uh, it's a wonderful time for us. And, and the other day in the car, she said, Hey dad, I'm seeing these things online where, dads and daughters that that love sports instead of having a dad daughter dance they might throw softball or something like that I was like hey that's a cool idea we can do that but I still want my dance <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> that's cool I haven't heard of that yet yeah, yeah. and then uh, one of my assistant coaches actually emailed me a little uh, TikTok the other day with uh, a dad and, and daughter and they came out they danced for maybe a minute and then the groom brought out gloves and they had a softball toss. Oh, wow. So that was, it was kind of a tearjerker, actually. Um, and I just think that it's, uh, I grew up playing baseball. And mm-hmm. so to, to now have my third daughter, uh, the first two were not interested in, in field sports of that nature. They played basketball. But to have her to go out and just throw catch with is just awesome. That's so, awesome. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. So you said you've been in business for quite some time. So tell us a little bit more about what you do in your business. Sure, sure. So <clears throat> currently I work with, with organizations that are either struggling to hit a certain financial goal that they have, or they're stuck at a financial level and they can't seem to break through to get to that next level. You know, they, they've gotten to 5 million, but can't get to seven or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. And I go in, my background is in human resources and I've got some operations experience too. And so I go in and I start looking at all of their people processes and people challenges, because what, what I've found in my career is when businesses get stuck, it has something to do with the people. Mm -hmm. Um, doesn't mean that people are bad. It just means there's something there that's maybe keeping them from performing at their best or from making that next leap for the business owner. And then sometimes it's the business owner not communicating what they need. So I like to get in there, do some digging, and then work arm in arm with that business owner to to get his or her business back on track to where it, it needs to get to. Awesome. And there's there's just so much joy in that when when someone comes to you and they're frustrated with what's going on. And then, you know, six, eight, 12 months later, they're back on the path where they need to be. And uh, they're shaking hands and thanking you. And it, it's a cool thing. That's awesome. So you mentioned you love helping businesses thrive. <laughs> so what exactly does that word thrive mean to you? 
So when I think about that, um, I think about a business that, that's firing on all cylinders mm -hmm. that, yeah, healthy profits are good and growth is good. But I think for a business to thrive, again, it, maybe it's my, my people background, but it has to come back to the people. And are your people engaged and satisfied? And are they committed to your vision? You know, without that, yeah, you can still push sales and you can push production. And you got a bunch of miserable people walking around. And to me, that's not a thriving business right. at that point. So when I think about it, I think about, well, are you generating the, the revenues and hence the profits that you need? Are you, are you recognizing your organization's mission and values and goals? And are your people engaged in those mission values and goals? And if they are, then I think you're firing on all cylinders. And I would say that's a business that's thriving. Okay. So what about an individual who's thriving? Like when you're looking at yourself and you're thinking, oh, am I in a thriving space right now? Like what helps you determine that? Am I having fun? Uh, for me, business should be fun. And okay. so I've surrounded myself with a, a team who I absolutely love working with. <clears throat> and that's important to me. Um, I've got great clients. I, when I'm going through the preliminaries with a client and, you know, they think they're interviewing me and can I help them? I'm also interviewing them to figure out whether I, I want to work with them. Yeah. Um, it's, it's very important to me. And I don't turn away a lot of folks, but I have turned folks away and said, I just don't think this is a good, good fit for us. And, and I've sent them on to, to some other very good consultants. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, for me to thrive, I can't look at my phone and say, oh gosh, they're calling again. <laughs> you know, that's just not, not who I want to be. And um, I've learned that if you set those boundaries for yourself, you'll start to attract the people that you need to attract. And I didn't believe that for the longest time. And I had a great mentor who, who uh, over the past couple of years has really got me believing and the results are showing that, you know, when you set boundaries, you'll attract people who will respect those boundaries and then they help you thrive. Yeah. And boy, is that a hard lesson to learn and to start implementing. <laughs> you know, it, people say, I remember the, the probably three years ago, four maybe, um, I fired a client. And, you know, that's a hard decision. We were only two months into what was probably going to be a six to eight month project. Mm -hmm. And it, it had some significant revenues attached to it. But uh, the owner was mistreating one of my employees who was on site with him. Um, he was calling me, you know, well into the evening hours and things. Mm -hmm. And after several times saying, hey, these are the boundaries. This is what needs to happen. Um, he just wouldn't respect that. And the, the straw for me was one evening uh, I was walking into to a church service and my cell phone went. And I wasn't going to take it. And I'm like, oh, it's so-and-so it's again. So I called him and he says, I got an issue. We got to talk. And I said, well, I'm heading into church right now. Well, well, this will only take a minute. That was it then. I said, I will call you back when church is over. And that night I called him back and I fired him. Um, and uh, it just, it was scary. Yeah. But the very next week, uh, the, the lady that I had in working with him, because she's now freed up, went to a chamber mixer, landed another client. So go figure, right? I mean, That's it's just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the universe takes care of you. So um, it, it's, it was a wonderful reinforcer for me yeah. that you got to do the right thing and work with good people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like you said, people is at the heart of it all, whether it's mm -hmm. for your, you know, your clients growth or your own. I yeah. firmly agree with that. Yeah. Absolutely. So Aside from having to fire some clients, <laughs> what are some other obstacles that you've faced while you've been trying to thrive yourself? Spending time making sure that I'm getting my own personal development. <clears throat> that, that really hit me two years ago. I realized I do so much training and so much analysis of my clients' workforces and their key people. And I thought, when's the last time that I really took time for me? And I don't mean like going to a conference and sitting in some sessions, but I mean, really looking at what are the things I need to work on mm -hmm. and, um, you know, what would challenge me a little bit? Because it is one of the challenges for those of us that are, are 
solopreneurs, right? I mean, there's no one telling us to go do this, go do that to develop yourself. And so um, I decided I had, I had enjoyed reading a bunch of uh, John Maxwell's books over the years. Mm -hmm. And I knew some folks that it had been certified through his organization. And I looked at that and I said, you know what, I think I want to go do that. And, and it was a wonderful experience, you know, wonderful growth experience to really take a deep dive into his teachings around leadership and, you know, how to make others leaders and things. Um, it was a eh, almost year long process. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful and transformative for me. Um, I continue to, to read more business books than I ever did before, which, which is important. I, I love to read. And um, too often I find myself reading fiction. And I still do enjoy that in the evening, but during the day, um, I like to take a couple minutes and just read a chapter in a business book or, or something that, you know, whether it's a magazine or article, or whatever, but th those times, those quiet times are important and um, it helps me think about things in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. What's your favorite book? Oh, there are good ones out there. Um, I would say there's one that, that I quote a lot when, when I'm public speaking because it has so much to do with your, your people and how to treat your people. And it's called Hug Your People. It's real simple. Okay. Um, it's written by a gentleman named Jack Mitchell. And he is a, a small business owner. He owns uh, some high-end clothing stores in Manhattan, I think up and through Connecticut. And he talks about the things that he does to keep his people fired up for him. And none of it's rocket science. And yet it's such an easy read and an insightful read. Okay. And I come back to that a lot with my clients when they start talking about employee engagement costing a lot of money and you got to buy all this stuff and you got to do all these things. I'm like, no, it's the simple things. You know, that, that's what really gets people, the simple things. Yeah. And that's the message in that book. And, and I really, really like that one. Um, and I'm currently working on one by Kevin Harrington. He was one of the original sharks uh, called Key Person of Influence. And I'm enjoying that one right now. I've heard about that one. I haven't heard the hug your people. I'll have to add that to my long list. <laughs> and and for, those, for those listeners who maybe are solopreneurs and have a lot of client type interaction, same gentleman, uh, Jack Mitchell has written one called Hug Your Customers. Okay. So, and obviously he doesn't mean that literally, you know, but, um, but it's, it's a very similar insight. You know, how do you go above and beyond to please your customers? Okay. He has very high end, you know, net worth individuals coming into his store, mm -hmm. expecting very high end products and services from his staff. Right. And so he talks a lot about how his staff then are able to meet that in his mind because he takes care of his staff. Absolutely. It's all one and the same. Yes, it is. Yes. So with the <laughs> books, obviously they've been resources for you. And like you said, that quiet time. But what are some other things that are kind of like your go-tos when you're trying to thrive? I have some very trusted people around me that I go to for advice. My wife is obviously one of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um and I also have some professional folks that, um, you know, I trust my marketing and my brand writers explicitly. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm thinking about uh, whether it's, it's a blog post to uh, a video to, hey, should I go speak at this conference and spend the money to get there? And I mean, I just, I love their input. I love their insight. And it keeps me grounded. Um, keeps me not second guessing myself, but, but because they're, they, I respect them and they've done so much for me, um, their opinion matters to me. Uh, I've had some great mentors and still have uh, some great mentors that I work with. Um, I think that one of the things I've done for about the past 14 years has been a lot of public speaking. Mm -hmm. And one would say, well, gosh, you must be really good at it. And I like to think that I am, but I also like to think you can get better. <laughs> and so uh, last year I worked with a public speaking coach. Okay. And the, the cool thing with that is we not only honed the way that uh, the way that I tell the story that I need to tell, but he helped me refine that side of my business. You know, that it, it doesn't have to be just a marketing thing. Mm -hmm. um, to get your name out there, it should drive some revenue for you. Absolutely. And um, 
not that that was a mind shift for me. I just, I was stuck. I couldn't figure out how to turn my speaking into a profit center. Mm -hmm. And I would get all the accolades. Oh, that was a great talk. That was a great talk. But it wasn't getting me clients. And um, the, the amazing thing with this guy is uh, I am in discussions now with a firm that heard me speak two months ago. And we're all but signing on the dotted line. I don't want to jinx it. We're almost there. <laughs> but it will be one of the largest projects I have ever landed. And it was all because the CFO heard me speak and was engaged with the topic and wants to get it into his workforce not just as, as a one-off, but as a year-long kind of process with his people. Congratulations. So, thank you. So I, investing in yourself pays off. It really does. I mean, it's hard to write those checks, you know, um, and especially last year during COVID when a lot of clients said, hey, we're going to hold off on these projects till we know what's going on. Mm -hmm. But every month I wrote the check to him and I said, I'm, I know this is going to pay off. I'm learning so much. And, you know, here we are six months later it's paying off. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. So I have a lot of people who ask me, you know, how do you find a mentor? So it sounds like, you know, you've worked with quite a few. So how did you find the best match for you? Hmm. You know, I think a lot of it was through networking. You know, I didn't sit down and say, I need a mentor. Um, <laughs> You know, this, this gentleman uh, that, that runs the, the speaking business, I was referred to him by a former business associate of mine. She had met him and said, oh, my gosh, you got to meet Ed Crow." And, you know, she calls me and says, Ed, you got to meet Majid. He's incredible. And, you know, he could probably really light a fire on your, your speaking career. And so it was that. And, you know, after the first couple months of working together, it became more, uh, more of a mentor-mentee than a client-type relationship where he was just delivering a service. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say the same thing happened with my marketing person. Uh, we found her, uh, a couple of us took an online class with her on marketing, uh, engaged her and that relationship again, it just moved on from just simple handling our marketing to her providing guidance on just general business things mm -hmm. for, um, and so that, that's been sort of the way that, you know, sometimes I feel like. Um, I'm Forrest Gump. I just kind of end up <laughs> where I'm supposed to be <laughs> or that little feather that keeps appearing throughout the movie, right? I'm just kind of floating around, but, um, that, that's where it's, where it's been for me. And, um, I have a very good friend who is uh, a banker and, and understands finance, obviously. And, and we get together and golf a lot. And usually during the course of golf, we're bouncing things off of each other that we're dealing with, uh, in our spaces. Mm -hmm. And, and so, yeah, that's a friendship, but there is also, we've called each other in the middle of the day and said, Hey, I got a business issue. Can we talk this through quick? Yeah. And so I, I think it's, I think it's all about recognizing why someone comes into your life at a particular point in time. Absolutely. So we, we always think about that on the personal front, but um, I think there's a lot to it on the business side too. Like, why is this person, why has this person been presented to me right now? Am I supposed to learn something from this person? Am I supposed to give this person something? you know, what is it? And, um, I, uh, I, I've, I very rarely said no to someone if they've called me and said, Hey, you know, so-and-so said we should talk Can we get together for coffee. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, you know, what's it going to hurt? Maybe we've got something in common, but we can do business together or help each other. Maybe not, but either way you meet someone new and it's, it's a face with a name and who knows where it goes after that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I am a firm believer and you can learn something from anyone. So, you know, whether it's a quick coffee conversation or anything, it's definitely worth it in my eyes. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah, a great nugget. So how are you using some of the resources, whether it be people or things and the connections that you have towards building a legacy? Wow. Um, <laughs> Loaded question. <laughs> it is. Um, you know, I think the word legacy is so humbling. You mm -hmm. know, you, you think about uh, names like Mellon or Carnegie or something <laughs> like that having, you know, legacies. Um, I think for me, you know, I, I remember early on in my consulting career, I had a lot of time and I didn't have a lot of clients, which meant I didn't have a lot of money either. <laughs> so I, um, I did a 
ton, a ton, a ton of networking and a whole lot of volunteering, mm -hmm. serving on boards, serving on committees, getting to know people in the community. And to me, that, that's a bit of a legacy um, to be able to give back to the types of organizations that are doing the work that means something to you. Yeah. And so, you know, early on, I, I didn't have the cash to make donations, but I had time. So, I, you know, I was willing to donate time and things. As I got busier and I had to cut back on some of the time, well, then I started writing, writing some checks to help them out in that way. Yeah. And, and that's just, you know, they're all small community-based organizations that, that I was passionate about. But I think when I think of legacy for me, uh, I go back to the whole reason I started my business. It wasn't to have a personal jet one day, which I don't. Uh, it was, <laughs> <Darn>. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to be there for my kids. Mm. Um, I, had, uh, I was working for UPS uh, for 12 years at the beginning of my career. And you know, it's, it's grueling. 12-hour um, days aren't uncommon. Uh, 50 to 60 hour weeks, pretty normal. Um, now, fortunately, early on in that career, we didn't have cell phones. And so, you know, when you took vacation, you were on vacation. Um, but <clears throat> I got to this, this position where I thought, you know, if I can, and, and UPS is a, is a good company, obviously. And I, I just thought to myself, okay, I, is this making me happy? Well, that answer was no, I, I was really not happy. Mm -hmm. I had no control over my own destiny. Um, you know, they had what they called a people committee who pulled the strings and moved you where you wanted to go and whatever. And if you said no or anything, you, it was kind of like career suicide. You know, you got shoved off to some night shift somewhere kind of thing. Oh, no. And so I said, you know, I, I, this just, I can't do this for another 30 years. Mm -hmm. And um, I had always thought about consulting and, and thought I could be good at it. And through my HR work at UPS, I had to be very involved in the community. And so I started networking before I left. And people were like, Ed, people need what you can do for them. Go for it. So, so I did that. And so when I think about a legacy, for me, it's more on the personal side that I never missed a ball game, a band recital, a dance recital, a uh, chorus. I mean, all the things that, that my kids have been involved in uh, over the last, well, my oldest is 28. Um, that means something to me that they know that dad was always there um, yeah. for those special things. And um, that's why I really started this business was to give me that flexibility to do work that I enjoy, but also be there for the family um, and not be so tired or so stressed or so miserable when I got home that I couldn't be present for them. Absolutely. So that's my legacy. Hopefully I'm achieving that. I love it. It sounds like you are. <laughs> That's awesome. So what nuggets do you have for some, you know, people who are just starting out or who might feel stuck and who are really trying to create a legacy of their own? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> when, when I started my business, it was, of all days, April 1st. So go figure on that one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the joke on me was it was April 1st, 2001. So just a few short months later, we had 9-11. Yeah. And, you know, everything basically came to a standstill, right? No one knew what was going on. And I had someone ask me at a mixer, well, gee, Ed, you've only been in business a couple of months. If you could have known what was going to happen, would you still have started your own business? And it was a great question. I thought about it. And, and I said, yeah, you know what? I, I still think I would have. And here's why. You know, early on in your business, you're trying to get networked enough so that people trust you and want to do business with you. I mean, how do you do that? You network, you shake hands, you kiss babies, you do all of those things to let people know who you are. And so what better time to do that than when maybe purses are closed anyway and no one's spending the money. So you may as well build relationships during that time. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> so I think that if, you know, we're, we're in these crazy times now, um, a little better than last year at this time, which is great, but you know, if you're sitting there, if one of the listeners is sitting there and they're saying, gosh, you know, I'm starting this business and, and I'm spinning my wheels, um, I would look at a couple things. I, I would look at how much time you're spending truly networking and how much time you spent really refining your message. Mm -hmm. um, what is it that you can do for your client? 
And are you selling that message versus selling yourself? Those are two very different things. Um, I'd like to think people hire me because they like me, but I know that they hire me because of what I can do for them. Mm -hmm. And again, those are two different things. Um, so I think for, for someone new, that's real critical. And as I've looked back at, at some of the mistakes that, that I've made over the years, I think one of the other things is not underselling yourself. I mean, there is a time to be humble. I absolutely believe that. I think there's also a time when the prospective client needs you to brag. Mm -hmm. Here, here's what I've done for a client similar to you. Or maybe if, you, if you've you just gone into consulting and all of your successes were in your private industry career, great, share those. Right. Um, it, it's, it's, to me, it's not unlike your resume, right? You do a little bit of bragging on your resume. And, you know, if you've got a relationship built with that person, they're going to see that you're being genuine and you're, you're demonstrating how you can help them. Mm -hmm. to, the, to the person maybe who's been established for a couple of years and is getting stuck, um, and, I, and I've been there multiple times over, over the last 20 years. I, I, when I look at the times I got stuck, I was stuck here. I wasn't stuck anywhere else. It was in my head. Mm -hmm. um, I would allow, I'm going I'm to bear my soul here a little bit. <laughs> I, would, I would allow this little saboteur to sit on my shoulder mm -hmm. and say, you're not good enough to do that. Or who do you think you are that you can do that? Mm -hmm. and, and then I'd be like, yeah, right, anyway. And I would let that little gremlin sit there and tell me these things that really weren't true. And so I started reading some stuff about this, this whole, um, they call it imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And the irony of imposter sy syndrome, and, and any of you who are listening that feel like you have this, I'm going to give you a nugget right here. <laughs> if you have imposter syndrome, it is only because you are successful. You cannot have imposter syndrome if you're not successful. It is impossible. If you're a loser who's never done anything, what are you impostering, right? I mean, it's, it's illogical. And so if you've got someone sitting on your shoulder saying, well, you're not going to, well, that means you are, you're having self-doubt, obviously, but you've been successful. Yeah. And that's, that's a scary. And um, once I got over that, um, and it took a while. Um, for, for me to, to really diagnose in myself what was going on there for me to break through that and say, I am good enough to sit there with the CEO of a $50 million company and play peers with him mm -hmm. or her. Um, and, um, you know, that may seem intimidating to some, but if you've got the solutions, age doesn't matter, gender doesn't matter, race shouldn't matter. I mean, all that, if you can bring the solution to that person. And when I realized it was all about the solution and not me, that little gremlin started going away. He pops up every now and then, but I don't, I don't give him the time that I used to. Have you ever heard of the book, Taming Your Inner Gremlin? No, I've not heard that one. It's a good one. <laughs> okay, maybe I need to look at that one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it's very good. But I love that. I mean, like you said, it's illogical and we can't have that you know, experience if we haven't experienced some sort of success. So that's great. Your listeners got free therapy. They didn't have to pay <laughs> a copay for that one. <laughs> awesome. So do you have any other nuggets for our listeners? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a time, you know, whether you're starting out, but certainly as you, you've built your practice up and maybe you feel you're getting maxed out, um, there, there comes a time when you've got to let go of some things, um, mm -hmm. whether that's someone to do your books or maintain your calendar, someone to handle your marketing for you, uh, or your SEO and your website, there, there comes a time. Mm -hmm. And I always look when I get to one of those junctions, I always look and say, okay, if I'm doing X, what's not getting done? Mm-hmm. And if I'm doing X to run my business and Y is sitting over here in his client work, that's a problem. And I was getting into that more and more really towards the end of last year. Again, I was going through that next cycle. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> as I said, now, I mean, I've got someone who fully handles my website, my SEO. Um, she works 
tightly with my uh, brand writer who helps me, you know, she co-writes blogs with me, comes up with our marketing strategy. Those two make magic happen with my social media. Um, I have a great graphics person who uh, has just given a complete refresh to, to my brand. And, you know, these are all things that could I sit and knock out blogs and post them on my own website? Absolutely. Is it the best time, best use of my time? No, it's not. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, my, my brand writer and I get on the phone a couple times a month. We chat. I riff on some ideas. She fleshes those out and up goes the blog. Mm -hmm. and, and that time and, and that bill every month, I am so happy to pay that because she is so valuable to me. And it's taken a monster piece of workload off of my plate. And so, you know, if you're, if you're getting stuck in terms of your time, then I'd say, take a look at that. Can yeah. you find a good virtual assistant? I have found amazing people to work with on Upwork. Um, if you're not familiar with Upwork, uh, it's a freelance website that, that's upwork.com. You type in the parameters of what you're looking for somebody and you'll get hits from people literally all over the world. Yeah. Uh, but amazingly enough, the, the two times that I've gone to Upwork, I found people right here in my own county. Oh, awesome. <laughs> and so not that that matters to me because my brand writer's up in Canada and um, the, uh, the speech uh, coach that I was working with, he's in Quebec. And, you know, so um, I'll work with anybody anywhere if they're, if they're really good and they're the best. Uh, it just so happened that I found uh, two gals who were awesome at what they, they do, and they're right here in my, in my hometown. So uh, it's worked out because we get to actually meet for coffee and, and hang out sometimes. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I will never forget a conversation that I had where someone was like, why would you ever think about uh, having someone clean your house? And I said, because when you get to a point in your business where it's like, okay, do I spend those two hours, you know, cleaning my own house or do I spend those two hours billing the client? What, you know, is going to cost mm -hmm. less and make that mm -hmm. more. And yeah. it was like a light bulb went off and I'm like, that was a pivotal point, you know, for me to elaborate a little more on what you're saying. Like, it's not just with business. You have to evaluate that in your personal life as well. It's absolutely right. Um, you know, personally, I love doing everything outside of my house. It's very therapeutic for me. So, yeah. you know, there were times, um, now we downsized a couple years ago, but um, there were times where my wife said, why don't you get someone to, to do the yard work? I'm like, but I like doing that. You know, I can go out. I love messing in the flowers and stuff, put music on. And it's, it, it's some me time. And I find when I have those times, that's when ideas start kicking around mm -hmm. for me. Uh, and so, yeah, but I mean, I think to your point, you know, maybe someone says, well, I love cleaning my house. Okay, great. Then don't give it up. Exactly. But if, you know, come to my house if you love cleaning the <laughs> house, you know. <laughs> but, um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think that, that that value proposition of, you know, what are you using your time for and what is the most valuable use of your time? Absolutely. And if you're a consultant type, I would say take a strong look at if you're billing by the hour. Mm-hmm versus billing by the project and for the value of the project. Absolutely. Um, those are our things that for whatever reason from day one, I went project. Mm -hmm. I think once or twice in the last 20 years, I've done a little hourly thing. Uh, but someone just asked me again the other day, what's your hourly rate? I said, oh no, I don't have one. Um, I know what it costs me to do certain projects. And obviously then I can build the value around that. But you'll be surprised at how many of your clients like the fact that you sit down and say, the project is going to cost this, here are the deliverables, here are the checkpoints, how much they're going to like that versus, oh, I got to bill for 10 hours this week. What did she do this week? I can't believe there's, you know, you don't have to fight those battles and it doesn't put a value on you then. Yeah. Right. Oh, you're charging $75 an hour. You're not worth that. But then you turn around and, and charge a client $7,500 for the project. Oh, now all of a sudden, they, they've seen results. It's like a, just a totally different mind shift. But yeah, yeah, I would strongly encourage anyone who's who's consulting type and that hourly bill just just get rid of that. It's, yeah, it's not good for your business at all. Yeah, I definitely agree. Well, I feel like you and I could talk about nuggets all day long. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> but I love the ones that you shared. They're very valuable. So, is there <laughs> anything else that you haven't shared that is kind of like a burning desire? Uh, 
to buy a tiki bar on the beach and just make margaritas for a living. <laughs> my burning <laughs> desire. <laughs> yeah. Got it. Uh, I, I threaten my wife all the time. If things ever go south, if I ever get sick of this, we're buying a little tiki bar. I'm just going to make margaritas all day. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just get the look, you know, like, what are, what are you smoking today, Ed? You know, this You're is, crazy. <laughs> so, um, but no, I, um, I have met a lot of people over the years who are married to the idea of being a business owner, but not to being a business owner. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being an entrepreneur is, is awesomely rewarding. It's also terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, when you are responsible and nobody's putting a paycheck into your bank account on Friday um, automatically, that's a terrifying proposition. Yeah. And um, so if you're too scared, and I've been there at times, you know, then you have to really think whether entrepreneurship is for you. Mm -hmm. But if it is for you, then you're going to figure out how to use that fear as the motivator. Yeah. Um, to say, I don't want to feel that fear anymore. And, um, and then you start doing the things you really need to do for your business. Um, but I think to, to wrap that up, it's, it's really, you, you can't come across as desperate though. Um, desperate people don't sell, um, desperate people don't build relationships and, um, it's really a turnoff for, for a prospect. So even if you are struggling or you're just starting up, just, just go into a client with confidence. And what you can do, you know, you're confident, you know what you can do to share it with them. Yeah. I, I've always been told when you focus on the lack of, you create more of it. So you can't focus you know, on the lack of the money and you're mm -hmm. just going <laughs> to dig the yep. hole deeper. Yep. It's very, very true. And it's, it really is hard to accept until you've seen it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and you and I have been around the block a few times and we've seen the revenue roller coasters and, and all the things that go with that. And, um, it's, it's very true. Yeah. It's very true. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate everything that you've shared with our listeners today. And it's definitely been a pleasure just getting to know you and your insights. Yeah. It's been a lot of fun. I appreciate you having me, Casey. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you again. <laughs> and how can our listeners reach you? So um, I am, if you type my name in anywhere, and I'm like the only Ed Crow around. It's the beauty of having a unique name, but my website is edcrow.com and that's K-R-O-W. Um, you can find me on Twitter, you can find me on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of all over those, those platforms. And um, I did publish a book last year uh, called Strategic HR, How to Drive Bottom Line Results Through Your People. And that's for sale on Amazon and my website. Awesome. I'll have to check that out as well. My list keeps growing. <laughs> so, well, thank you again. And I'd also like to thank our music sponsor, Stephen Lamar Moore, who created the music for our podcast. So again, it's been a pleasure and I look forward to seeing you thrive in the future. Thanks, Casey. Thank you.